This video is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about a couple of the other podcasts and teams that, that write articles and, and talk about NRL Fantasy here. We've got the NRL Fantasy Amateurs, their website here, guys, if you want to check that out, and also the Talking League guys as well, who obviously I've uh, collaborated with a few times, haven't done a lot with the Fantasy Amateurs, but I do uh, listen in on their stuff. And it's, what I'm really getting at here, guys, is super important to get a few different perspectives, especially at the start of the season, on certain guys, you know, Someone might say something a little bit different about a guy. They might analyze it in a way that suits you better. Yeah, it could be very analytical, could be a little bit more feel. The mixture of both of them together is obviously a little bit more uh, my style in terms of you know, looking at a guy and, and seeing his role and stuff like that. So we're gonna go through a bunch of different articles here and one that they wrote, which was great. I took out the what I found were the best bits of one of their articles here. And the first part here we're going to talk about is the buys. So what they're looking at is guys in six-week blocks, which is which is really cool. So the guys that have a buy in each of the first six rounds, finishing off at the Sharks in round six. And they're actually saying that it's probably not the worst idea of having a one of these players or two of these guys that have a buy early, because what that does is actually get it out of the way. And what they're getting at here is, is in that first sort of three rounds, you most likely have 21 or close to it uh, players that are actually playing. You might have uh, Sloan in your team in round one who's not playing, but then from round two onwards, he will be. So you're looking at having around 20 players available each and every week. So if you have a guy that's on a buy in those first sort of three to four rounds, you're not gonna miss out too much. You know, look, you, you might have to play someone that isn't gonna average as well. You could lose about 10 points, for example, instead of a guy that's gonna score 40, you might have a guy that's gonna score 30 or so, uh, 28, something like that. Cover that guy in the first week. So what they're saying there is it's not the worst thing to have guys with a buy early on. Look, I can definitely agree with that. My caveat to that is the fact that those points are very valuable early, obviously. Um, and if you're missing out on those points early, you're going to drop down the ranks. And we know how important it is to rank high in those first five rounds, for example. We see the guys that won the comp last year uh, and guys that are in that top 10, top 20, top 100, for example, they are in a really, really strong position in those early, uh, early rounds. And then they can uh, really do a lot of good work through the middle part in trading to get themselves uh, you know, right up there and then holding that position. Obviously, the, the best thing about this is the fact that they remove their buy and then you can hold them ideally for a large part of that first part of the season and they can be a stalwart in your side and make sure that you get points each and every week when other teams uh, other coaches for example are going to have players on a buy and you know potentially some injuries come up some suspensions some guys lose their position you know potentially someone comes back from an injury uh, and this guy that you had as a cash cow or a mid-ranger he has lost his spot so definitely yeah, some merit to it, I think, but there's, yeah, it's just another way of looking at it for sure, which I think is really, really cool. Um, yeah, as I said, you look, you know, you aren't looking to, to trade a guy because he has a buy coming up. You know, if they're in round seven or eight, nine, for example, you go, oh, I might have to trade them out at some point. Whereas these guys, you've got them out of the way. You know, if you did have Nathan Cleary with his buy in round three, that is a bit of a trouble that week. You might lose some points and lose some rankings. That's the main worry with him. But then from there, all the way to round 13, you have him as a great captaincy option that can do a good job for you. Um, yeah, and with that being already attractive, it can arguably be even more so with their predictable early buy. And hopefully you have enough players uh, there to, to cover that. So... Yeah, really, it's a important thing to think about, as as they said here, is you don't you're not losing all your points, guys. If they do have a buy, so if you have someone like Brandon Smith who could average about fifty, you could, your eighteenth man will come in and replace him. Hopefully, at like a thirty to forty kind of range. So you're only losing you know, anywhere between ten to to twenty points there overall. So it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, it's also not the best thing in the world. So you know, completely up to you as to how you want to play this. We're looking at trades now, and the difference this year, they've added eight trades, right? But the difference in rounds one to 19, because they do hold back a, you know, eight trades there for the, for the last section, is you do have 0.2 uh, more trades. So from 1.68 up to 1.89, which is obviously ideal, but you are playing with the fact that there's a buy each and every week and you have guys out. So naturally, you're probably gonna trade a little bit more just based on that. So this is you know, enough help to that, but it probably is a bit of a wash as to last year's trades versus this year's trades. And we know how much of a shambles last year was uh, in trying to, to get a good 17 on the park each and every week. So in short, they've said there that job security, uh, job secure squad depth is gonna be great. So if you've got a guy that you know 
Uh, he might have you know, a decent amount of value, nothing crazy like a 10 points of value, but he has some security in, in that position and a little bit of value could be ideal during this part of the season where it's very hard to get a strong 17 on the park. Dual position players are always gonna be gunned, so that's great there. And then you'd like to be buy planning uh, at that start. So they spoke about last year, they wrote extensively about buying players with job security, dual position status, and nothing really changes this year. It's also gonna be critical when selecting early season, mid season cash cows, as you cannot afford Zach Sini's and Billy Smith's, the guys that didn't go very well because of that extra buy. You can't have a red dot just sitting there in your 21 for week in, week out. So we had David Wiley last week. There was a guy that really did that for a long time. Zach Sini for a lot of people, uh, plenty of other guys there. So the big worry there is that you pick up someone who only gets a couple of weeks of uh, game time. You know, someone like Isaac Thompson is a little bit of a worry, but there's talk that he manages to keep that position. But if you're picking that 250K guy, 230K guy that might be on the end of a bench, you know, middle forward, for example, could be Matamua. We're not exactly sure what his role is going to be at the beginning of the year. If you pick him up, he plays that first game and then gets dropped. And, you know, eventually over time, someone comes back. Bateman comes in, for example, is, is a good one there. Then he's a red dot there, and that becomes even more annoying than it was last year. So be aware of that, guys. You want some security in the players that you pop into your side. Okay, so we may want to choose some risks with DPP players or players in tough positions on the fence of value, particularly where they have solid job security. Yeah, so again, he's talking about certain guys like Xavier Savage, Jake Avrilo. I don't really like Avrilo as a pick. Again, that's my opinion. I don't think he's going to score great. They're obviously cheap, um, safe in the side, potentially. Uh, have Savage, I, say, I would say, has the upside, whereas Avrilo, not at fullback, doesn't really have the upside there. So very interesting to start there, guys. But if you haven't joined the private group team, I would really appreciate that. It would support me a lot. There's plenty of prizes up for grabs. You get the events that I'll pay for as well. Um, you know, the merch and, and everything going on there. Plenty of, of exclusive content in that group. So if you'd like to join that, I would really appreciate that. And check out the shorts as well that we've been putting up on YouTube. Okay, theory number two. There is such a thing as too many pods. So the biggest thing here to, to talk about is the fact that you know, if you're anti, if you're going for a pod and going against the grain on someone that's pretty highly owned, there's usually a reason someone is highly owned, right? It's because they have a good chance at a good role, good chance of making some money and scoring some decent points. There's obviously some that the the crowd are going for that aren't going to be great or probably aren't going to get a long-term position. There's guys like uh, Tafare who has 25% ownership and most likely doesn't make the final the, the starting team. But even if he was to, he was on the bench or if he gets one game, his spot isn't completely safe and he's someone that you could definitely avoid. But majority of the guys there that are highly owned, the Brandon Smiths and stuff like that, there's just not enough upside for you to be able to fade him, which is what the boys are saying here. Look, you decide to buy, he performs as expected and succeeds in gaining value. Awesome. You decide to buy, he underperforms and you don't get the value from him, but so everyone else did as well. So it's not a big issue there. You decide to avoid and he succeeds. So at best you have an equally good option and at worst you have a dud pod instead of making the right choice. Yeah, so potentially the biggest thing here is that if you are fading one of these guys with high ownership, you have to select someone with a lot of value. And if you don't, then it's not gonna be worth it for your side. You decide to skip and all right, he fails. Now, as he said, did you manage to get someone who succeeded and, and gained some value? Because if you did, then that's great. And that's really the only one where that really works if you if you pick that way. So there's a 25% chance that you get, if you antipod, you get it right. Uh, and even then it's probably still not amazing because the other option that you've gone for, most people uh, would have either went for, or he's a pod for a reason and he's probably not gonna score amazingly well. So that's, uh, that's the big question mark there uh, around that and why you should go for a lot of these highly owned players because the majority of people that know what they're talking about have selected that guy as well. Okay, and he's got a copy and paste from uh, 2022, guys. This is from the Fantasy Amateurs website. Let's see what we've learned. So this is their thoughts this year. So pretty much the same from last year, as I said. But start with Nathan Cleary and Captain Him. It's a great option. They also have uh, Cam Murray as a, as a buy as well, which I'll speak about in the next article um, as a captain this year. But start with him and Captain Him. He's safe. He's got to score great. He gets an early buy. Not the worst thing in the world. Start with Payne Haas, Adam Dewey. So two guns that they think that have you know sort of five or so points of value and are going to be guns for the season so you don't have to touch them for the entirety of the year and three or four other underpriced potential guns so that's the goal there is to pick up guys that have five points undervalued or so that can be a gun in their position 
that's the way they want to do it. Ensure the 14, 15 other players you have uh, selected have eight plus points of value, which is obviously the goal each and every week, uh, each and every year. Um, try that first, and if you can't do that, then you might have to muck around with your team to, to get a certain amount of guys from a different position that have that points of value. Fill your team with as many popular, secure players as possible, which is great, which I said earlier. Ideally get players with dual position, of course, and select players with favorable buy schedules, either very early or very or late. Yes, great, that last one. Just be aware, guys, that if you're looking at a cash cow or a value guy and they have a buy in round seven or eight, like the Tigers or the Raiders, for example, that six or seven rounds is gonna be enough for them to make the money and score the points that they need and you can move them on for a guy that had a buy earlier on the year. So don't take that one as exactly as gospel. Obviously they, they are saying that as well. Um, they just didn't mention this article about those value or, or cash cow guys that you can move on from and, and move up to a, uh, a better guy. But yeah, seems easy, doesn't it? Don't overthink it. So that's that one with the, the amateurs guys. Pretty cool article and I, I suggest you look into a couple of their stuff, which I'll um, explain here further. So. Next thing they speak about is the overall captaincy, and then we'll get into the Mercado, which was Jason Robson's article around uh, Havili's injury and what's gonna happen with those Rabbitohs forwards. So he really goes into a nice deep dive, which we'll jump into next. So captaincy wise here, he's got a few options. There's three captaincy options in their eyes, Cleary, Hines, and also Cam Murray. Awesome. Cleary and Hines have a buy in the first six weeks. Cleary in round three, Nico in, in round six, and Cam Murray will play all the way up to round 13, which is gonna be great. Obviously, we think Murray's going to score a little bit lower, and I completely agree pretty closely with the projections that they've got here. Murray, I have a 64. Cleary, I have 68. And Hines, 67. So basically the same there. I'll uh, be looking at captaincy-wise. You captain him and he averages 65 over that time. Murray, he gets a little bit of an increase on Cleary and Hines. Obviously, you have one week there where you haven't got a captain, so you add a replacement, probably about a 55 or a 60, if you have like a Harry Grant or you know, a Haas or something like that, you could captain and get a 60. So probably can get an extra five there, but safely a 55. And then you've got an emergency replacement coming in at about a 30. So hopefully by later on, if you were to have Heinz as captain, for example, round six, hopefully you have someone that's able to score 35 or 40, but to be safe, again, you've got a guy coming in at 30. So really you end up pretty close in terms of the amount of points that you get from all three of those players. It shows here that uh, you know, Hines is 21 points better overall. Cleary is 43 points better off overall, but there's a few other things at play, which we'll speak about here. So he's got here replacing an elite, elite tier captain with an option like Burton or Cotter. It does come with a risk, right? Because you know they could come out and be a little bit less consistent than those top guys. Just be aware of that if you aren't going for someone like Murray each and every week. Yeah, Burton Okada, yes, there's that. But you can go guys like Haas, you can go guys like Harry Grant. They're, they're a little bit more safe. So I feel like this is a little bit of a narrative chaser for, for Murray to be a captain, considering that's the way they're going to play it. So I think you can get someone that's pretty consistent um, if you were to go with Hines. So if you had Hines, I'd go with a Haas or a, a Robson, a, a Grant, for example. There's, there's Damien Cook. There's a lot of different guys that you could get that especially by that point, you've got, had a, a good look at all the different players that you can potentially pick in your side and have as captain. So not the biggest uh, issue there, uh, I don't think, but Murray's gonna be great regardless, especially with their start to the year. They have a, a lot of tough games, which means he's gonna get some big minutes for sure. Same goes for placing points with a Dury, Sloan, Talao type from the emergency. Could easily score post of 15, yeah, instead of the 30 that they're talking about there, which is completely fair. But, you know, they're looking, as I said, at a big, Big call on Murray here. Uh, Cleary did have a bit of a down year. Murray had his best year. So have that in your mind as well. I definitely think Murray's gonna go great, but just have that uh, in your mind as well. Then, then rather than just focusing on um, a little bit on the, on the negatives there, yeah, you're just basing it off Cleary's floor last year. Yes, it's good to go off that, but he has had multiple years before that where he was absolutely dominant and averaged way higher than what he did last year. So that's that. Uh, I personally probably not gonna start with Cleary just for the buy in round three, but I, I'd like to give him some flowers as well there in that one. Uh, so let's say you get the, the 55 and 30 that they spoke about. Murray's 53K and 80K cheaper than Hines and, and Cleary there. Is two to four points per week better, really, per week really the best you can get with that 50 to 80K? So that's what we're talking about there. You're about 20 to 40 points difference over that uh, 12 rounds by going for Heinz or Cleary and having that replacement there. 
So they're saying that that 50 to 80K, can you do better with that? And most likely you can. If you spend a little bit less, hopefully you can get about a five point to six points of value, which I completely understand and is why you would go for Murray as captain. So uh, I do really like that analysis there. And guys, are, you know, awesome, really smart guys, the, the fantasy amateur boys. Um, so yeah, flowers to them for, for doing a great job. And that's very important considering uh, price per point, you're looking at sort of 14,000 there. If you get that times five, yeah, you're looking at sort of just under 60K times six, a little bit more. So really, it's a, a pretty good option to go either one of the three. You're not going to go wrong, as they said. Uh, and then if you want to go a little bit out of the box, you've got guys like Payne Hass and, and Harry Grant and stuff that could average somewhere in the low 60s, but come with a little bit more risk, uh, but a little bit cheaper. So yeah, there's a, a few things they mentioned there, like Cleary has a high ceiling, blah, blah, blah. But you know, Murray had a, a terrific season, a low floor, and scored much higher as well. So Plenty to talk about there, guys. And, and then they speak about buy, buy manipulation. So they've got these teams here who don't have a buy all the way up until round 13. So getting guys that you can comfortably just breathe and have in your side for the entirety of that first 12 rounds is going to be great for your psyche. You don't have to stress about looking to trade them out. Hopefully you can make some cash on them. And if they're guns, you, you're probably looking to trade them out in round 13 because they're gonna have a buy, uh, a lot of buys during that middle period. But then the other option there is you could just hold them for the entirety of the season. So definitely plenty of questions uh, around that. But I definitely think they're obviously the guys that you'll be looking to, to take. And then you've got these guys who have the buy through that middle section. So very interesting. If you've got some cash cows and value guys from this team, then they're going to be fine at the start. But a lot of these guys could be good to, to bring in some guns after their buy in that period. And hopefully they can play well through that middle. But again, looking at the buy schedules for each of these teams is going to be the best way to go about it. They've got here just a, a bit of an idea of guys that you know, have late buys, for example. They have a really early buy in guys like the Dragons players, but then they have, the rest of these guys have pretty late buys. So you look at the type of squad that you can make and, and it's not bad. Obviously you got a bunch of the 250K guys uh, and you know, really, if you've got a team like this, you, you need the cheap guys to go well, but then you've got these guys you don't have to worry about at all in Murray, Haas, Robson, Elliot, these types of guys until later. In, in the show. So yeah, really good idea uh, to, to be trying to build a lot of your players with guy, uh, with a lot of, build your team with a lot of those players from teams in that first, uh, that don't have a buy in that first 12. And if you're looking to uh, avoid uh, these types of players with, with buys in the middle is, is their worry. So yeah, very interesting, you know, especially with guns and stuff like that, it could be a little bit awkward to fill a strong 17 during that time. So there, then you've got the uh, the buy period manipulation, which is pretty interesting. You yeah, spoke about here, you had Captain Cam from the start all the way through until round 13. And then you can move on to someone else, which would be pretty cool. So options here, he had a Joey Tarpany, who is one buy down and doesn't uh, and is available through 14, 17, and 19 buy weeks, which is pretty cool. So thinking about that is pretty is gonna be helpful for your side guys, is to move on from some of these guns in certain time periods and you know because we have do have a lot of trades if you can conserve through the first part of that or that middle part there with some of these guns especially not having to do some trade turnover with those guys and really just trading your cash cows your mid value guys um doing a lot of good things there just trading that and saving your trades for this middle part you can really move around some of those guns they're going to miss multiple games like murray's going to miss a heap of games over that middle period so great idea to kind of move on so there's definitely some theories that you can go for there move a guy on to a, another guy that's had his buy already the things we sort of think about during the normal buy periods of, of yesteryear uh, is the way you need to think about it the whole way during the season this time so yeah we used to get really excited you know the, the guys that play have played this game for a long time the the buy season is, is a lot of the time the, the most fun part of the season so uh yeah you get this for the entirety of the year now which is really really cool and obviously the run home uh, is in there as well, but so much talk uh, around these guys um, and as to you know, players that you would be looking to select in certain times and stuff. So check out this article, guys. Uh, that's the NRL buy planning one, but that's enough on that one. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. We've got the Mikado here with Jason Robson. So the Havili headache and with him going down, there's always some interest around guys like Tavita Totola. We've got Jaime Sele and Davi Moale. So the interesting thoughts uh, around here is, is just the the way that this team's gonna set up. They lose Mark Nichols, so there's definitely a little bit of space in this side. And and this is how they've got the team you know, looking to run out in round one. Blake Taft looks like he'll probably be the inter, uh, utility guy who can play in the halves and play yeah, at fullback or in the outside backs as well. So I think that 
makes sense for, for him to be in there as a utility type of guy. And if that's the case, then you have three fours on the bench. And we saw Jacob Host there last year for the beginning part of the year. And when he was able to get uh, good minutes, he would move to the edge. Jairo would come to the middle. And and then you've got really splitting minutes between Totola, Hame Sele now, uh, Arrow a few in the middle. Murray's going to play big minutes, probably 60, 65 on average, you would say. Games with 75 and 80 minutes and then games with like 55 when they don't need him as much. Tom Burgess, his minutes are slightly diminishing. And then you've got Davi, who you know, has a few less minutes there. But look at this graphic they've got up, which I really like. On average, Murray for 65, Tavita for 55, which he, if he gets that, he probably has a bit of value. But is he a top-line keeper in your side? That is going to be the question mark you need to answer. Harmey Selly, if he can get 40 minutes, there's going to be some value on him as well. Tommy Burgess is going to be no value. Davi Moale with 25, probably not at this point. But that's uh, obviously something you need to think about as well. What we're looking at here, uh, the minutes are we're going to vary each week, like he said. Murray is the captain, or likely play 70 minutes or more. He has Murray as captain in his team as well. So a few of the smart guys in NRL Fantasy have Cam Murray as captain. So I, I don't see the issue either way, as, we, uh, as the Fantasy Amateurs just pointed out. You're looking for Murray to slightly improve. If he does, then him as captain is going to be super safe and a great option. If he doesn't, and if he's like a 60-point 60 uh, 60 type of guy, and, you know, Cleary and Hines are closer to that 70 mark, then it obviously won't work out. But at worst, you have him all the way till 13, and he doesn't really lose much cash for you. But anyway, in terms of the projected minutes, he looks at Totola and shows that he has a, he's a bit of a pod um, you know, late last year, and he averaged 49 when playing 40 minutes or more in a match at a nice PBM of 0.96. So when he got those opportunities for, for more than 40 minutes, he was doing really, really well. What you see here is he averaged 50, 60 points uh, in uh, 60 meters in post contact, which was great, really high in the NRL, 18th overall, um, and, and made him one of the, the better players in that in that front row position in a good team, right? So you look at his stats overall, and he had a nice base of 40. So again, a great little uh, table here, which uh, which helped out, uh, which will be very helpful for a lot of you guys going forward. Uh, but that 40 is really, really nice. And when he's priced in sort of a, a mid, mid 40s type of guy uh, at 628, then that in, the, that in itself has him pretty well at his price point. Any dynamic category, which is those attacking stats from there, and you're going to be getting a bit of value from him at that nine. So it just really all this is showing you now is that he's got a bit of value there and it looks like his minutes are safe. So if you're looking at what the amateurs were saying there, you're looking for a type of guy that could average in the 50s would be nice for, for a front row forward, given there's a bunch of guys that can average in the 60s, who has a bit of value, obviously. He has some safety in his team. So he is the main front row forward in his team and he can score decently for you. And you can hold him all the way through to round 13. So that's a, or sorry, all the way to round 16, actually, when they have their first buy. So very interesting there. And that's that's him. And then you look at other guys. So Totola is probably a better option, but are there, sorry, a better option than the other two guys, but are there better options in that position at that price point? That was the question you have to answer. But if you like him as a pod, then it's going to be great. So yeah, plenty of information on Totola there, guys. I just wanted to point that out. And you look at guys like Selle, if he's expected to play 40 minutes, he has a PPM of about 0.83. Looks like he'll average about 33. Coming in price at about 24, you've got some value there at 336, which is great. So if you're thinking about popping him in your side, there's no issue there at all because you know he's got a bit of a, a career uh, track there as being able to average pretty high um, yeah, in 40 minutes, which we should expect given he's going to be the, the second main forward and you've got someone like Jai Arrow playing about 20 in the middle as well as some time on that edge. Uh, it's going to be fairly easy to to map out the minutes for this squad. You know, we got Sele in the, in the finals. He played uh, some good minutes as well. Very easy to say that he's going to take Mark Nichols' minutes, which Havili could have taken. So now that Havili's out of the picture, it makes it pretty clear that 40 is going to be there uh, and, and really good there. So... Uh, he's obviously spoken about the fantasy, fantasy averages as well. The the value of picking up some of these guys, if they can come out and get the 40 minutes and average 33 straight away, you can kind of get 100K or so fairly quickly. And if he does have happen to have a game of sort of 40, 45 uh, with some attacking stats, then he could come out and make some cash quicker and then you could move on. So we want these types of guys that we know have got a clear role to start and they can come out and, and do really good things. And really what he said here with Davi Moale is the fact that we don't really know how he's going to look. He doesn't have a massive PPM. 
the minutes, are they exactly there? We're not exactly sure. He's got him about that 25 mark. So really, there's some potential beneficiaries, as, as they said, with Hamesele, with Totola, probably a couple extra minutes. And then guys like Murray, uh, probably clearly playing that 65 to 70 minutes. So unless anything further drops in terms of news, then really this is where how it's going to look. So that's the the Mercado. I think that was really helpful, guys. And, and yeah, just check out all the different podcasts. Obviously, yeah, thank you so much for listening to mine. But everyone has a different opinion. I just thought it'd be great to come in and react to a bunch of these articles that have been written at the moment in preseason because they've been absolutely spectacular. So well done to you guys. Thank you very much. So just wanted to go through the last few things here on a few different plays that amateurs have done. So they go through and have a bit of a write-up on all these guys and go through as a buy, a caution, or a trap, which I think is great. And guys like Burton, who I've been speaking about, they're really high on as well. So they, they spoke about him obviously averaging about the 57 mark for the last 15 games of the year. I think it was or close to it. And you know when he picked up the goal kick and stuff, all that really improved. Uh, and you look here, he's got an average of 56 when he wins. So the Bulldogs here, they have an improved side and he has some guys on his left side that's going to improve him. Uh, and you know really some of his stats were a little bit low in terms of missed tackles, for example. Run meters were a little bit lower than they were in 2021. Uh, for the um, for the Panthers when he did get a, a go at six. Tackles were up in that year as well. So really there's a little bit of room for movement with him. So really that was the big thing with him is that he could aver average anywhere between sort of 57 and 60 something in this side. So not real downside, priced at 50. It's his side, got the goal kicking. Uh, you probably just lock him in your side. So that was Matty Burton. I think that was a good one, but very similar to my analysis. Just good to get a bit of an insight uh, from different guys there. Adam Elliott, they've got a little bit more on the caution side. So really they've got him around that 55 minutes, which would price him out to uh, about that 50 mark or close to it. So when he's, you know, he's got a break even of 41 and a half, that's eight points of value, which is pretty nice, right? But the, the thing they want with him is if you're picking up a guy in the later mid range, the amateurs are wanting him to get to a 50s something average there, which if they say that he can get to a low 50s, then he's a clear buy because that's good enough to be you know, borderline keeper status in the front row forward and you're getting value on him and he has a buy in round 10, which at worst, I think you can move him on in round 10 there. So they're a bit surprised that they've got there's 15% of teams that got him because they think there's probably a little bit more value, like 10 points or so elsewhere, rather than that eight mark that you're seeing with guys like Elliott. But you could say that he has a little bit more upside in terms of minutes, considering Clemmer had 61 minutes a game, Barnett had 66, and they're both gone. And you know, Saifidi is a the guy that plays some you know 50-ish minutes, and they probably need a guy to play that 60. So if Elliott was to get 60, then he's a low 50s to 55 type of scorer, and then he's into keeper territory. So I think the more the big thing they're talking about with him there is just the fact that there's probably a little bit of uncertainty around him. Ruben Cotter, they're really excited by him. Uh, I am as well. I just was worried about the inconsistencies. But if you're really looking at it, the, the big issue was the ha the hamstring last year. And he obviously got the 59 minutes in total for a 55 average points last year. And he's you know priced at about that 52 mark, which is yeah, you know, which is interesting. And that was taking out a couple of their um a couple of his lower games, I believe. So um, yeah, you're looking at here, when he played over 50 minutes, yeah, sorry, that took out those other games. He averaged 62.7 minutes for 58 points. So PBM a nine, a 0.93. They have a few guys out as well. So that's the biggest thing to think of is it looks like Mitch Dunn is going to be out for a few weeks. Lukey is also out for a month. They've got Lucy Laylor stood down and they've got some aging forwards, which they described here with guys like James Tamo coming up, coming back. So really, if he can get anywhere above that 60 plus minutes, then he has like a late 50s to 60 type of average and makes him yeah, pretty well a keeper and you get him all the way through to round 13. So yeah, as, as I've been saying, I have him pretty close to Carrigan, but he probably has a slight bit more upside given that there's probably a few more minutes up for grabs with him. And we've seen, we haven't seen him play the big, big minutes in, on a regular basis, but when he does, he scores amazing. We saw what he did in the start of Origin and we saw what he did in the final series. And you know, with Tamalolo being managed well minutes-wise, then he could be the guy that is getting got to get the big minutes for this Cowboys team. So that's that. And then just lastly, Val Holmes. If you're looking at a team that's going to start really well, how good's the photo there? He can be one of those guys that can do that. He didn't play super well in the, in the start there with the first 12 games averaging 37 and then the back 12 averaging 51. So if you think that the Cowboys can come out and start really well, then he could be a guy for your side that could do a great job. 
51 average at the start for a center position that's pretty low on players. If you get Alamotti and stuff, it definitely helps out. But Isaac Thompson is, is only there for potentially one week. He could be keeping that spot. But if he doesn't, that's a bit of a worry. You've got Tommy Talau, who's very inconsistent, obviously in a better team, but coming off ACL surgery. There's just not really many great players in the center position. And Val Holmes could be the guy that works great for you. What you see here is it doesn't matter too much. He scored 46 against bottom eight sides, 43 against top eight sides. So obviously you probably want him to, to be a guy that absolutely dominates bottom eight sides in that first bit, but I really don't think it matters. If Cowboys come out and do really well, he's going to get plenty of goals. He will score tries on that strong left side with Dearden, for example. Uh, really, it's just going to be who's going to be that back rower on that left side. If it's Cohen Hess, then he's obviously a solid runner of the footy. I don't think it changes too much for Val Holmes. Um, and Murray Talangi on that side. But overall, I think he's a, a good buy as well, but it's just very hard to fit a lot of these players when you've got guys like Murray, Payne Haas, you've got Nico Hines, you've got Grant, you've got Robson, all these guys as being screaming buys as well. Do you have enough space for a gun center in your side? But overall, guys, that is that video. I hope you enjoyed the rundown I could provide from some of these other podcasts and articles that they write. Obviously, I'm a little bit more of a speaker in terms of my videos rather than articles, but it is great to get a different perspective from a lot of these different guys. And I hope you enjoyed me reacting to it. Uh, and if you haven't checked out those guys, go and do it. And I uh, really appreciate if you liked it and share this video, guys, to, to other people uh, that you know are going to be playing fantasy this year. Get them involved. I appreciate it. And look to join that private group. I would really appreciate that, guys. See you later.